She why, does it to piss me off. Why can't I do that? <laughs> Come on, you can. Do it to piss Gwen off. But it's funny why because... Why are we doing it? What? Um, to sync the audio on the, the video. Do you know what you remind me of? I'm going to wait, I'll say that at the beginning, won't I? Go on. No, I'll wait. Um, is it bad? Who? No. Is it bad? Oh, this is Brad. Who the fuck is Brad? <laughs> Brad. Yeah, whatever, Drew. In your dreams, mate. Oh, oh right. Okay. What, you again, the leadership specialist? Yeah. yeah. Full-time shit-chatter. <laughs> yes. Oh, All right, this is cool. going to be tasty. Yeah, it right, is going to be tasty. <laughs> right, okay. Are we going? Yeah. Are we looking okay. at the... No, no I am. You, I am. I do look at it. <laughs> Are you right? I'm, I'm all right. Yeah. I'm just wondering why you're looking at that. Um, She's welcoming the, welcoming the guests. <laughs> Shoot them, McGavin. Do you want to welcome everybody in? Welcome. Welcome <laughs> to Say Out His Podcast with these two legends, Gwen and Fee. Buckle up for the ride of your life. <laughs> no? Yeah, no, no. I think we well, should have that to Well, I'm just going to reel off that. I was. Oh, go on then. <laughs> Welcome gonna... to episode two. You've just been introduced by our episode two guest, <laughs> leadership specialist, Drew Povey. Thanks so much for introducing us and coming on our show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I hope that doesn't actually get used as the introduction. Of course it is we going are to be. Okay, sticking. it's a beautiful thing. Welcome. <laughs> People are going to listen to that and be like, end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the shortest podcast listen of history. <laughs> Thanks for coming, well, Drew. Yeah, it's been yeah. nice. Bye. <laughs> yeah, it's been emotional. See you um, next time. Yeah, I was saying that you remind me a bit of Liam Gallagher. You're giving me Liam Gallagher vibes. Liam Gallagher? Yeah. That's quite good. Oh, There's there worse are. people to be there compared are, yeah. to, I suppose. Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, yeah, gave me them vibes. I mean, he's not probably as talented as Noel. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Is he? Well, well, that's controversial. Isn't it is it? controversial. Did you mean Liam or no? No, Liam. I meant Liam. <laughs> you meant Liam. Liam. I'm, I've been to watch them both live. Have you? Yep. Which is better? Liam. Were they, I mean, were they together at the no, time? No, they were not. Right, okay. Very separate. So you've seen them separate? Seen them separate, yeah. And Liam was better? Liam was better, yeah. Yeah, he's a no, good No, didn't get the crowd to connect as much as Liam. Yeah. Funny enough, at the end of the, this, this relevant for this episode right now, but anyway, end of the uh, concert, everyone left. And then next thing, he runs back and goes, Silly billies, and then the, the stampede of people just ran all the way back because he just tricked everyone to think the show was over and it wasn't. <laughs> Did anyway. he use the term silly billy? <laughs> he literally goes, Silly billies. <laughs> if there's ever a phrase I didn't think Liam Gallagher would use, it billies. would be silly billies. Silly billies, I pinky promise. Really? Silly billies, yeah. Wow. I know. But anyway, <laughs> how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you two? Tired. Yeah, tired we are. Long Not day. Good, though. Yeah, yeah. Long day. It's yeah, you, get you, were there. Ladies. <laughs> you, you were there. You were there. I was. So a long day. It wasn't particularly long for me. I was just standing watching. You lot were in the mix, away. Did you enjoy us doing the bike sprints today? Yes, that looked Wait, painful. You watching, yeah. were you? Yeah, yeah I was you watching. stood in the chamber. Oh. I was a did voyeur. You, did you find that um, you couldn't breathe as well because of the because of the altitude, or I, does it not affect you when you're not out of breath? I didn't really notice, to be honest. Oh, because I did. I just <laughs> wondered why the lights were turned off. Oh, because <laughs> if you can't see each other, then you just feel like you're just in a dark place because you are. You were in a puffer coat when you're not. Hot. No, it's it wasn't freezing. hot in there. It I'll wasn't hot in there. Yeah. It, the heat wasn't on, just the altitude. Well, that's the thing, is it? Yeah. I thought that it was the same thing. No. Oh. <laughs> no, I, I, I thought the whole on. place was freezing, so I kept my coat on all day. Uh, you did have a really yeah. big coat. I did, didn't I? <laughs> it was like oversized, yeah. big puffer uh, it jacket. It looked like football mum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the look I was going for, Gwen, um, so I'm glad I pulled it off. Just for context, <laughs> we, well, we're thinking back when we met you originally... That was summer last year, wasn't it? Summer last year. Yeah. Summer last year. Came into camp, didn't you? I did. Give a big old speech. Yeah. Well, about half an hour, I think. No, Actually, about no an hour. it was longer. It was about it was an, an hour, hour, wasn't it? Yeah. It should have been half an hour. And we hour. were all waiting to go for dinner, weren't we? We were. And at first, at first, oh, before like, we knew anything about you. Who's this guy? Yeah, we were like, oh, not very funny, but I'm so hungry. And I know what I've ordered <laughs> and I'm really excited because <laughs> I've got a star on a main and probably someone will give me their dessert. And then we sat down and then literally from minute one to the hour, I was literally like, no, that's exactly actually. Genuinely. Can you zoom in on her face? Because it's exactly what she was like. Like that. To be fair, <laughs> when you opened your mouth, I was like, "All right." I thought rugby you've got league. a good accent. Rugby league. It's, enga it's <laughs> engaging. Accent. Yeah, like I, yeah, I, I, yeah it engages. I reckon me. I've got more northern over the years. Yeah. Yeah, probably because you've realised yeah. that it's engaging. Probably, so, like, yeah. So, so subconsciously, yeah. Yeah. I'll just go with it. Drop my H's, <laughs> <laughs> and we're all right. Um, <laughs> we're all right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you gave us a big backstory on you. On your journey. Yeah, life. Yeah, life didn't bullshit it. 
Yeah. Is that how it is? Literally. Which is, yeah, we yeah. like that. And then, well, you were, well, do you want to say about, about your book? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said, we were going for food afterwards. And we had to drive to the restaurant that we were going to for food in. <laughs> and you were, were you in the car with me? I was in the front. Yeah, so we, a couple of us went in the same car and I was like really quiet for the five minute car journey. And we got there and they were like, you all right, Gwen? And I was like, yeah, just just ordered Drew's book. That's all. <laughs> I was like, I was on the way it. back. Ordered it, literally. We left the veil. Yes, Gwen. Ordered it straight away. Started reading it the next day. Next day delivery. I was Amazon like, Prime. we've just left the... You've just, like, we just finished speaking about five minutes ago. And you already ordered his bloody book. Yeah. Oops. Oh, well, at least you didn't... I appreciate that. At least, you I know, know like had that. an impact and all. Thanks. I mean, I could have given you a copy, couldn't I? <laughs> really. <laughs> It's a bit tight. Yeah, in hindsight, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll have your other ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, yeah I'll, I'll send you those. Deal. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, I loved it. Do you know what? You were great. I mean, well, what we'd actually oh, arranged to do. <laughs> no, but as a, as, Thank you. As a group, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I meant actually the collective. I, I know, you I know. You two were particularly good in said session. You. Thank you. But no, um, I, we were only supposed to do, the, the plan was just give them five or ten minutes on, on, on your story. But then when I started, you were all like really engaged. Yeah. Exactly, really, recording really. new shit. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was going to be a bit shit, see, when we first started. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's it. You were obviously, I was stood between you and dinner, which yeah. is never a good place to be it's with a, a load task. of athletes that have yeah. been working and grafting, because that had been a hard day as well. Yeah, it had. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, you all came in, but I started, and then you were all engaged and, in, 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 you know, yeah. asking questions about it. So that, that bit was extended. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just thought it was very interesting for me because. The explanations you were giving on certain scenarios, I was like, God, that's quite that's me, that is. Yeah, you resonated <laughs> that's a lot, me. Didn't and you? you kept you kept going and going. I was like, sorry, I looked off the deal to think, I'm sorry, have you broken confidentiality or something? Are you just <laughs> you've got him to describe my life. And after I went home and I was like, Who the fuck is that man? That's just you and Dad describing my entire life. Um and afterwards I was like, oh, I'm gonna have to say something, and I you keep hitting that. I keep hitting stick. it because it's, I'm giving like, you know. <laughs> to, my, to my statement I was like I'm going to have to say something to this guy and then you rocked up the next day and I was like it's fate I was like right don't be a weirdo now I was like nah I'm going to be that person I went up, I went up to you at the end of the session right Drew yeah I was like then just came out like word vomit you know that story you said <laughs> that's me that is that was you and I was like yeah. god Jesus but then yeah fast forward a few months couldn't get you on season one yeah, you are. Busy we man. tried, didn't we? We did, we did try. try. We did try. It was my diary, wasn't it? The damn right. thing. You it do is. live a million hours away. <laughs> we do. <laughs> I do. I we do. See. My family do. I do. Yeah. All the way up. Did <laughs> 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 you, you watch that? Are you, are, you, are. are you happy with that readjustment? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't see you. There was I just know. a bar. I was like, I actually can't see him. I could just That's see funny, the word road, uh, and that was all I could see. Oh, sorry, everyone. Can you see now? Yeah. Got her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we are. Now, we're in see. now. Okay. Anyway, shall I? Okay. Where cool. were we? Anyway. If I was taller, that wouldn't have happened. Then if I yeah. was shorter, even or taller as well. That Either have way. Happened. Either but way. We've, we've found a workaround. Yeah. Where were we? I can't remember. You were talking about the fact that the next day you came up and you oh, just yeah. went. Pfft. Yeah. I did. You just took it on your stride. To be fair to you. Yeah. Well, I think you know if somebody's willing to come up and give you that level of honesty. I love that. I don't know where it comes from. It takes a lot of confidence. It does. And I I, I also think for for someone to be vulnerable, you know, we we talk a lot about authenticity. Well, you can't have authenticity unless you have vulnerability. Mm. You know, we we can all be authentic when it's going well, when we're winning the game, when we're on top of the world. We can be authentic then and you'll see it on social media. Real authenticity comes from vulnerability. When you can put yourself out there during your tough times and say, hey, I'm not having a good time or this is difficult, that's when the real authenticity comes out. And when somebody opens up to me, you know, some people can get upset, some people can get emotional, they can get angry. And in the leadership work I do, I'm saying, look, you've got to understand from my perspective, that's a privilege. Mm. You mm. really show me you. And I appreciate that and I respect that and I'll deal with that in confidence, of course. But when someone does that, it's them really showing you them and then, of course, you can have much more meaningful conversations when it's on purpose. But I think maybe for me, maybe because you were vulnerable first, so I maybe I wouldn't have had that connection with you or felt comfortable if I hadn't seen that vulnerable side of you too. Because obviously when you spoke up in front of us about what's happened through your life that's got you to this point and why you're now doing what you do, I suppose that vulnerability for me, I was like, maybe that's why 
I don't know. I felt comfortable because I've never done that before, ever, ever. I, think so. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, again, it, it was a privilege when someone does that. But I think there's there's so many people on social media and in the world in general, and particularly in in the leadership world, that are going to talk about all the good stuff they've done. Yeah. You know, and that's that's nice to do. And people have had successes, and they should be proud of that. But at the same time, you've got to own your difficult times too. And I think by opening up and talking about difficult times, the whole reason I wrote the book uh, with the brilliant author Sam Draper um, that Gwen very kindly bought <laughs> straight after the session. Um, uh, you know, the whole reason I did that was because I don't think people talk about the difficult times enough. And when you two shared that you were doing this podcast, I was like, this is important stuff. This is everything I believe in because if we only talk about the good stuff, yeah, you know, and there is great learning to come from good stuff. Some people say you don't learn anything from good stuff. I, I disagree. I think sometimes we don't celebrate and learn enough from when it goes well and, and, and see that success leaves tracks and, and learn from that. But we all learn a hell of a lot about ourselves, about the people around us, about how life works during the difficult times. So we should open up and talk about it. And I think that if I can do that in front of people, and it can encourage other people then to open up and say, do you know, I'm struggling with this. Or do you know what? This this the other week wasn't great for me and I didn't handle it particularly well. Let's learn from it. Because if you don't learn from it and you keep it inside and the emotional side of it starts to take hold of you, you can have real trouble. And 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 I think we need to move past that and we need to get better at that. So things like Say It How It Is are, are important parts of that ongoing dialogue and mindset shift that I think we've got to have. Yeah, and that's a big thing around this podcast is why, where the ideas stem from, purely from my own life and my own experiences. <clears throat> and, the, the, you know, the tough things we speak about all comes from that, like, the same purpose where, yeah, you someone could have achieved something great, but it's come from something, usually something, you know, tough or something traumatic. Which often is not, people don't see that. Yeah. And that's why it is so important to speak about it because externally someone might see both of you and just be like, Look at them, like they're so yeah. successful. I wish I wish I was them. I wish I achieved what they achieved. But they it's not until you open up about how you got to where you are that it, it makes people realise actually it's not it's not all sunshine and butterflies, yeah, sunshine. as you say. It isn't. It yeah. isn't. And have you ever seen the um the iceberg of success by yeah. Sylvia Duckworth? You know, what you see above the surface of an iceberg is five to ten percent of the success mm -hmm. of the glitz and the glam for you as elite athletes. You know, they see you on the pitch, they see you travelling abroad and they go, Wow, isn't that amazing? What they don't see is the 90 plus percent underneath, which is the challenge, the disappointment, the discipline, yeah. the hard work, the graft, the grit, the desire you've got to have to go through that. And within those difficult times, you're right, they're the things that sculpt us. And of course, that's the biggest bit of the iceberg. But everybody focuses on the top bit. And, we, we, you know, we do live in a world that wants short term, quick fix, X factor, silver bullet success. It's not really there. You know, it's the, the funny thing I saw on LinkedIn uh, a couple of months ago. I'm a 10 year overnight success. Yeah. What a great phrase because mm -hmm. no one is an overnight success or, by the way, an overnight failure. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point, actually, because I think in the same sense that, you, yeah, success doesn't happen overnight, neither does failure. And I think so, it's something that can often maybe slip with people. I'm sure you've seen this with your work in leadership and going into teams and seeing like people think that one mistake happens and then all of a sudden that's the result, like failure is a result of that. But actually it's letting those 1%, those little habits slip over time. And that applies to all sorts of walks of life. So but, true. Yeah. So true. Um, consistency is, is really, really important. You know, whatever we do consistently will compound over time. So if you're going to take a shortcut, and you're just going to, you know, take the easy option, well, you'll keep doing that. And over time, you'll see yourself fall away. And, of course, you don't see the failure overnight. You say, and, and you don't see the success overnight. It comes over time. And you, it's what you consistently do that is just so significant. And not enough people see that. And I think when people get their head around that, and that idea of what is the difference between ordinary and extraordinary, what is the difference? Yeah. Opinion, potentially. Maybe. I think it's like, I, I, I'm going to try and get this right, but essentially it's like about coming back to the habits and whether they can be like negative or positive. It's hard because often the things that are really like 
easy to do. For example, I think I've heard on a podcast before, like brush your teeth every day. Like if you brush your teeth every day, as you should, you don't really see the benefit of brushing your teeth every day because you brush them every day. And then if you were to not brush your teeth today, tomorrow, the next day, you probably won't won't notice you know have bad breath or whatever but you don't really notice but if you don't brush your teeth for a month you are so significantly worse than where you were a month ago however if you brush your teeth every day for a month you're not going to be amazingly better than where you were a month ago you're just going to be at the same level so I think that's that's a tough thing because you might do something day in day out and just think is this doing anything? Like, because you're not getting any significantly better. But if you stop doing it, that could be detrimental. Well, you don't see the outcome. Exactly. You don't see the outcome. It's the same with compound interest. It's called the compound effect. There's a great book in it by a guy called Darren Hardy. And it's it's a really good book because it's very simple. You know, when things compound over time and it's good stuff that you're doing, you'll see the fruits of your labour in time. When you take the shortcut route, that again will grow and over time you're going to have a big problem but to the negative so mm. it's always working out but let's go back to that question what is the difference think of the wording between ordinary and extraordinary the extra bit what more extra. you what are you doing more that's it <laughs> thank you very much well, well done. done top of the class thank you. Well well done. Done. what are you Stick doing differently you. to yeah. somebody else yeah just the extra bits mm. bit of extra time the bit one of extra percenters effort. the one percenters now you get those and you compound those over time now that's where the magic happens. I think we're quite big on that, especially being sports. Yeah. Like people. Yeah. I don't know what I was going yeah, with. Yeah, it's, sports, a, it's, but a, it's like, a term that's used often is gain the extra 1%. Yeah. Because I think where you look at us now is that like we're professional athletes, but most of the other nations, let's use the Six Nations, for example, are also professional athletes. So it's not, it's no longer like, it's like, okay, here's our level playing field. So what are we doing mm. to get ahead of that playing field? And how can we manipulate our training week to get like squeeze every drop is something our coach use yeah. that uses we've got to get you've got to get everything out of it and if you're not getting everything out of it then you're leaving stuff on the table and like we in our camp a few weeks ago we had to stand like a few of us from each group had to stand up and speak and like we spoke about values and stuff and I was like I want to speak about the intent part of the thing especially being out for a year makes you really like really reevaluate kind of the environment you're in and how much like the one percent has really mattered. I suppose you take that for granted when, you know, you're gifted it every day and you're fit and you're fine and every limb works. <laughs> <laughs> but like, it does make the difference because, like, okay, if you're talking from a sporting perspective, those extra passes that are making your te technique that extra bit crisp or those, you know, one hundred percent runs rather than you go ninety percent, like that is gonna that can matter when it's down to the seventy ninth minute and you. Of course again. You know, mm -hmm. two points difference. Like, and I think it's under actually believing in it. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, I can't hear myself. Oh, she just pulled. She just pulled her mic. Pulled the wire out. She's so passionate. I am so passionate. <laughs> <laughs> More passion. More public. Um, I think I need to do it again. Um, what was I saying? <laughs> I was going to say that. It's, uh, I don't know. It's the good habits oh, in yeah. the 79th minute Sorry, yes, that'll get you yes. over the line. But, like, actually people buying it and believing in it, like, you know, I think, well, like, when you talk about values and all this kind of stuff, everyone just goes, oh, yeah, right, and you say it and whatever, but it's actually action in it, because I'm big, especially now, after the last year, those 1% have been a massive part of, like, everything I'm doing every day. Like, I always, the, the security guard in our training centre is like, you're the first one in, the last one out. And I'm like, yeah, He's there a long I am. Time. But I'm completely proud of that because at least I know I'm doing the everything extra. I should be, you know? And the extra bits, and, and you're right, it's about intent. Mm. You know, you, we all know we can, we can come in and we can go through the motions. Yeah. Or we can come in and we can give it everything. Now, I think we, we do have to be careful with that. I'm quite interested in the idea when I talk to business leaders or, or sports people or the police or the NHS, we can't fall into the 100% myth. And the 100% myth for me is you can't be 100% 100% the of the time. Yeah. Like, we, we can't do that as human beings. And, and I think when people fall into that kind of self-help trap, oh, you can be whatever you want every day. No, you can't, right? You, you're a human being and you have emotions and you're going to have good days and bad days. But the idea is to get as high as we can as much as we can, as regularly as we can. And then if you do that, you can compound, as Gwen was saying earlier. You you will compound that over time. But I think trying to be everything all the time is exhausting 
and it's not realistic. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Looking at it. <laughs> what I, but the way the percent, I, sorry, just the percentage. I'm saying, like, yes, if you're that's giving, what I was say. Oh, we're just so <laughs> um, great minds. <laughs> it's just the percentage of what you can give. So if you can only give sixty percent, but we're giving one hundred percent of that sixty. Yeah, like that's the difference. I think like. It was so many days recently when I've like got like forty percent to give, but I'm giving all of that forty rather than giving you just ten of it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's like just giving the percentage that you can give, but making sure that you are maximising what you can, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm being aware of that. That's yeah. Exactly what I was gonna say. Oh my god, was we're it? all in sync. <laughs> this is incredible. Yeah. <laughs> It's something to do with the studio. Yeah. It's got us all aligned. But it's no, it's not. It's the it it, it comes down to that intent. It mm. comes down to the mindset. And it comes down a lot of this will come down to the effort people are willing to put in. But fundamentally underpinning the foundation of that for me is being aware. Yeah. You know, being aware when you're not quite a hundred percent that day. Okay, well, I'm aware of that now. What am I gonna do about it? Yeah. Because I think so many people go through life in times when they're not aware of what, what they're feeling. You know, we there's a, there's a lot of stuff I do in, in the business world about emotional regulation. You know, we talk in, in a lot of environments about our thinking. We talk a lot about our behaviours or our actions. I don't think there's enough conversation about how we're feeling. And, and I, I also, you know, challenge myself and, and everyone else in the world with how often do you say to yourself, how am I feeling today mm. or, or, or how am I feeling right now? Because emotions are a big part of what make us human. And, and I'm always tempted to laugh literally out loud when I'm in meetings and people go take the emotion out of it because mm. I'm kind of like, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> good luck <laughs> dealing with human beings. That. Correct. Yeah. So I think we've got to be more aware. And then from awareness, then we can recognize and then we can start to regulate and I think some of the emotional regulation, particularly in sport, you mm. know, you guys know yourself, you, you're in a big game. The emotions are high. Yeah. Okay, well, let's recognise that. And then, of course, once we recognise it, how can we regulate that down or up, depending on what we need? I think we've worked on that quite a bit, like, together over these last few months because, like, we've been okay with it's okay to be sad. Where, like, especially in a professional environment, like... <clears throat> Oh, could be deemed as a weakness. You have to turn up and be tough and be smiley and be brave and be fierce and all this kind of stuff. But, like, I think we've reassured each other that if you're having a tough day or, you you know, whatever, it's okay to be sad and, like, encourage each other to kind of not rationalise it, but, like, speak about it and then find a solution to, like, yeah, okay, but you're sad, but there's this or this or you can look at it like this. Okay, X, Y, and Z. And that's you know? definitely nice to have that, that um, like someone else who's going through the same thing to have that to bounce back and forth off of. Because Absolutely. for me, if I, you know, I love my dad, but if I ring my dad and I say, oh, like, I'm really tired. Yeah, me too. I've been at work all day. I'm like, I don't need that, dad. Like, yeah. I know you've been at work all day, <laughs> but you haven't got an ACL injury. <laughs> <laughs> and you've not been in the gym for 72 hours. <laughs> but like to have someone who you know knows exactly how you feel. Like if there's, there was days on there, like back in the early bit of rehab where I'd be like crying at the start of the gym session. And then by the end of the gym, Fionn's crying. And I'm like, come on, Fee, we've got this. Like, you swapped. Yeah. You, swapped. you have my emotions that I started with. And you have my good vibes yeah. at the end. But um, it's just it, it, like what you're saying with the regulation. Like it took a lot for me to be like, it's all right to be like that during rehab, for example. It's just learning how you can utilize it and like, Anger is something that you can get, like, experience a lot as well when you're injured because, like, I think more so when I injured my ankle, it was like I was angry that it happened. But through that process, I learned that, like, being angry isn't going to change anything. So trying to flip that emotion to something else and use it as an inspiration to be like, okay, well, I'm angry that I'm not playing now, but think how much better playing is going to be when I'm back and trying to use think, your emotions. I think that's really cool, actually, because... Um, I read something, this was probably four or five years ago, and it was a piece of research from a university, and they, were, they called it emo diversity. And it said when people are reflecting on emotions, they'll just go, I feel good, that's it, or I feel bad. And they don't actually dig into what it is, and there's so many different emotions we can have. You know, you might have been angry, or you might have felt a bit frustrated, mm. you know, or you might have felt disappointed, but 
actually understanding what the emotion is. You know, how can you deal with something? You don't really know what it is. You just go, I feel good. Okay, mm. great. Well, I'm really pleased for you, yeah. uh, but I feel bad today. Um, and, and I think the other thing that you said that I was really fascinated by was about the idea of other people around you getting where you're at. Because yeah. that is when you know, you know, I say in the book, life's a team sport, and it, and it is. Yeah. And you've got to get your A team around you, and you've got to find the people <clears throat> who can really be empathetic. But again, I'm not sure any everybody always understands what empathy is. And, and the coolest thing I read on that was um, the word empathy comes from a Greek word, which means empathia. And that's got two parts to it. The M is in, and the pathia is in feeling or in emotion. So you've got the in and then feeling an emotion. So it's you, if you're being empathetic, being in that feeling, in that emotion with that other person, mm -hmm. really feeling what they're feeling. Now, when I, I thought about that, I thought that's great because very often we hear it and we think we cognitively go through it and say, well, this is where they are and maybe I need to do something or say something. Or, But actually being in the feeling gives you a real great understanding of, of where they currently are. And I think you'll give better advice and you'll be a better support and you'll do things to them that will help them more if you truly are in the feeling with them. And it's a challenge I try and have with my own kids, you know, um, trying to get in the feeling with them, with whatever they're going through. And I suppose when, when you came up, on and and just just were brutally honest mm. i actually saw that as an incredibly brave thing to do because you know you'd met me for what 45 minutes to an hour yeah. and then you You're were like telling me well i mean yeah we've less of the strange <laughs> if you could. we didn't know each other <laughs> you don't mind if we could use that this, I always think of stranger <laughs> danger in these moments and I'm thinking... This strange man. <laughs> I could do without this. Thing. I could do without it. But no, it's. Um, mm. I thought it was incredibly brave. And then I listened to your podcast and I knew some of it, mm. but not at that level. Some of it. He's been really, really... What's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. Modest yeah. there. You, you were a big part of that. Thank you very much. Well... Thank you. But, but I mean, I, I didn't, I, it wasn't my story and I didn't come and tell it. No. And, and, and what I would say is that for me took great courage. And I think courage is an interesting word. I think we think it's about going, okay, we put something out there or we take the leap of faith. We've got to remember courage is the ability. You didn't just talk about it at one event. Mm -hmm. You put it out on a podcast that's still out on the podcast. So you're willing to stand Stop by reminder. that over time. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I've just seen Fee going, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's delete it. <laughs> I've forgotten. I've, I've moved on. I've slept since through. No, but you... it was that, that, that is brave. Putting something out there and leaving it out there is yeah. different than just going on a stage and saying it or opening up to a few people. And, and even though the information's out there, the fact that you put it out in the media, I thought was really brave of you. Thank you very much. <laughs> She's not very good at taking compliments. Yeah, I'm I know. terrible at it. Um, but I generally think... You need think... to look at that. I'm oh. just going to pick up on that. Oh, fucking hell, Drew. <laughs> no, I am. I'm going to pick up Thank on you. that. I'm going to cry in a minute now. No, that's fine. Oh, God. If I don't get you crying, I'll, be, I'll feel like a fail. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> no, seriously. If somebody gives you a compliment mm. and you don't accept it, what does it say to the other person? Is it, is it rude? Well, it shows that maybe you don't value their opinion, but you oh, do, but that's how I it do. might be perceived. <laughs> Could be. So if I turned up here at this lovely podcast studio and bought yeah. you a present yeah. and you just ignored it and moved on or made a joke about my gift. I wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that? No. But you'd do with a compliment. <gasps> and i tell you what I've noticed over the time, having thought too much about this, <laughs> is that what happens is then is that those things will dry up because people will go, well, I can't do that because we, the person doesn't want it. And I know that's not true. And that's not me having a go at you. That's just me saying we have to be really careful because a compliment is somebody's way of giving you a gift. And, and I learned this. I learned this very early on and somebody pulled me on it. You know, someone said, that was a great talk. And I was like, oh, you were great. Your organisation was great. And it became this little, let's pass the, the compliment <laughs> backwards and forwards. And actually, somebody saw me do it and went, just smile and say thank you, as you yeah. would a gift that anybody gave you. And it really changed the way I thought about it. And I thought, you know what, that's, that's a really important thing. And I understand why people don't do it. I, I understand why people want to put it on to somebody else. But 
when I say to you, I think you were brave to tell me, I really mean that. And when I say I think you were brave to come on your podcast, your podcast, not somebody else's, your podcast, and talk about it, that's really brave. And it was a really, really good thing to do. And you should be proud of that. And I'm saying that not to give you a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling or to make you cry because <laughs> you should be proud of that. Thank um, you. And it's an important thing that you've done because you don't know the impact. Yeah. You never know the impact of the words you've used or this podcast both of you have <clears> created <throat> will have in the world. And there could be somebody sitting there at home with that issue yeah. or an issue that you cover and they don't know what to do and it's lonely and the room's dark and they don't know where they're gonna go next. And they put your podcast on and the light comes on and they can see a way forward. And, and that is so powerful. And you never know the impact of the things that you do can have on others. Sorry, my emotions can't deal with this today. <laughs> Say so thank great. you. <laughs> thank you very much. That's good. <laughs> thank you. I feel like I've achieved. <laughs> well done to both yeah, of we you. We did that um, big spiel. Just oh, you oh my God, I'm warm. Um, oh, I thermal regulation's um, a bit yeah, off, isn't yeah. it? Um, <laughs> It's interesting, really. <laughs> Mine was today. That's why I bought that bloody yeah. coat. Yeah. I was freezing. I couldn't get over my ice bath this morning while cold shower in the um, hotel. I just oh, couldn't get over it. That's why I was cold all day. Ice bath. Freezing. Oh, yeah, well, there's, yeah. Well, you can join me on my bike session tomorrow if you want. The heat isn't going to be on. I'll, I'll cheer you on. All right. You okay. won't need your coat for that if the heat's on. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Going back to what you said, I genuinely don't... This is honest truth. As if this could be a compliment to you, actually. You might take it quite well. Who knows? But I genuinely think if I didn't, um, if you didn't come and do that talk today, I don't think I, no way I would have done this now. Like that's me being really honest. Like if yeah, I didn't listen to your story that day, there's no way on this earth probably wouldn't have gone through with this whole idea of the podcast or done said spoke up about my story. There's no way because <clears throat> I don't know what it was. I was just sat and I was really zoned into what you were saying. And I do struggle sometimes to keep concentration, but I was really interested in what you were saying because it was so... Resonated like, so Yeah, much, it resonated it? so much. And to the specific detail of what you were saying with the examples you were given, I was like... It, it was like it was fate. It was really weird, but it just felt like I, it was meant to be in that moment and, like, I was meant to hear that speech. And, like, it was like a moment for me where I was like, oh, my God, okay, now is your time. <sighs> <laughs> you gotta breathe in before you breathe yes, out. <laughs> <laughs> that was really funny. But oof. But there's but there's things happen. Aren't, yeah, aren't there? you speak in life. No, <laughs> but in, in 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 life, I think that you know, when I hear something like that, that is a huge compliment to me. You know, I do what I do because I want to help people, and I want to help people to develop. That's the whole reason my wife and I set the business up. And it wasn't about commercials or money. It still, was about... Still going. <laughs> that's all right. Just just let it out. Just, oh, my God. We're going to be in in the feeling with you. Oh, so we we're are. not sobbing in a couple of minutes, Gwen. We fail. Look, we've failed. Oh we, I've learned on this podcast that when Fionn cries, I, I don't cry because someone needs to speak. <laughs> Otherwise, Gwen often speak. the guest is kind over of there. Our podcast <laughs> media and communication. <laughs> so works. when Fionn cries, she goes... And it's I got what well, Fionn's trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> the translator. Yeah. No, I, I, I think oh, that um, God. there's these moments that, that happen in life. And <clears> as I was saying, you know, my wife and I set this business up to help people develop. I'm really passionate. Doing a book is not easy. You know, Sam, yeah. Sam if he was on this podcast, would say to you, you know, I wasn't easy to work with. I'm, I'm hugely dyslexic. You know, so I don't write the book. I speak and somebody else, you know, creates the, the content. And he's an, he's an amazing author. And, and Laura McInerney, that did the, the other books with previous to that, these people were brilliant. But it was all about what can we put out that's going to help people in some way. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying I recognise it when other people have that same mission. Yeah. This is about getting people to say it how it is. That is so important in a world that, we think sometimes, and it's only a think this, it's only a perception that we think it's just got to be the good stuff and look at the new thing I've bought. And the, really, is it? It's not, that's not real life, is it? It's part of life. Absolutely. And we should celebrate that and be proud if we can go and do nice things and have a nice holiday or buy the nice house or the car or the watch or and, and, and. But actually, no, it's more about 
the whole of life, yeah. which is tough times. I just think that, like, like I said, I never, like, the only people that knew kind of about my story properly were like a small handful of people. And then I've just met this guy that I've just rolled all this information out to. And I, I was like, you talk about courage. And I was thinking, where's this courage come from? Like, and I think, like, I just connected with your story, which then, yeah, everything you're saying about what, like, we are trying to do with this podcast, I felt I had from you, you sharing yours, if that makes sense. And like I say, the examples you gave. And then, yeah, I, I, didn't, I don't know. And now I look back and I'm like, if that, gosh, how things could be different if I didn't have that, if I wasn't there that day. Um, but, yeah, like I said, then I did that. And I was like, you gave me the confidence to be like, yeah, I, I back you that you want to, speak out about it and like stuff like that and then now I look back and I'm like yeah what we've made fast forward back like eight months ago is, that's where it stemmed from which is pretty epic now that we're both sat on the sofa you know sharing well, well it is, a, sharing it is it amazing and, and that makes me incredibly proud to have played a tiny part in this you know it, it yeah. really is so thank you okay. smile <laughs> That's how you do it. That's how he does it. Uh, something I wanted to touch on, which is something you covered with us back in that first talk you had with us, was above and below the line. Yes. I love this. I love, love this. this. Love it. This is this is that's something that I've like really like taken into Chef's my daily <laughs> taken into my daily <laughs> life. <laughs> I like it. Like, we get yeah, all Italian, really, I really, continental Well, theme. I get told I'm very expressive, so this is what I'm telling you. I really, really like it. No, I've since then, well, it's on the wall, actually, in training. Mm. But It's quite it's funny, a, though, because the line is up here, so technically speaking, we're all below, below, below the line. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't thought about like, that. Are they trying to tell us something? Well made. Because we're actually all below it. But, <laughs> no, I really like that, and I never really thought about it that. And, like, there's people that... It resonated with us loads, because we were like, well, we... we First of all, let's explain about yeah, the blow of light. So it comes from um, uh, two brilliant writers and researchers called Connors and Smith. And they uh, produced uh, a couple of books around this, Change the Culture, Change the Game, The Oz Principle. And they were looking at, which is something called a performance pyramid, where you've got results at the top of the pyramid, right? That's like the end outcome of life. And they come from actions, and that's where most people stop. And I have to say most businesses or most people I work with, they go, well, if I take these actions, I'll get this result. So if you want to lose weight, I'm going to exercise more and eat less. Or I want to have a savings plan, I'm going to spend less and consolidate a couple of credit cards, loans, whatever. They're the actions that will deliver these results. What's below the actions, though, are the beliefs that we hold. Now, I'm fascinated by people. I'm fascinated by mindsets. I'm fascinated by performance. And it's the beliefs that we really have or don't have will drive the actions. Because we'll either do them, or as we were saying before, we'll marginally do them, or we'll half ask them, as we'd say up north. And you'll do them a little bit, but they won't get the results. But a lot of the, the beliefs we have come from the experiences that we've gleaned over the years. And, and, and it's that pyramid from experiences that we hold to then beliefs that we keep hold of that will drive the actions that deliver the results. And then from that, okay, well, when we've had certain experiences, they can influence us. If we've had a great experience, our beliefs will be boosted and our actions will have more gusto to them, <laughs> uh, like you banging on the uh, and this and bang, smacking these nice sofas that have done nothing wrong from what I can see. Um, and then they'll deliver the results. But what do we do in difficult times? This is where the bit I'm getting interested with people because when, you know, we've heard all the quotes, you know, something bad happens, it's either going to make you better or bitter, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But what does that even look like? How can we frame it? And I think giving people models in which to think through something or potentially frame something and then reframe it is where the magic in these elements can, can come. And that's why I write models in all the books. You'll see little models that just help people to understand or think about it or gain a shift in perspective. And the, the above below the line is there's, there's two elements below the line, which is where we can blame play the blame game we can <laughs> sorry i'm not hit a raw nerve here. no there's this there's this quote from like episode <laughs> one of season one where and two Fionn's and three like and four like you know i can sit here and i can blame i can play the victim but the only person that that's gonna affect is me 
That's beautiful. Isn't Thank it? You. That's a beautiful line. But it's just line. funny because it what keeps What we need up. is, could we could just play that line at this moment in the podcast. That would be amazing. <laughs> right. and relive the moment. It's a clip. <laughs> the clip. I actually think my impression's pretty good. As well. <laughs> it is. That was your impression of me. I know. Yeah. That's it, like when we did impressions, that yeah, was yours of me. Anyway, blame. Anyway, so below the line, below the line is about blame, <laughs> or it's about excuses, or it's just about rolling over, waving a white flag, let your tummy be tickled, and me being a victim, wearing a victim t-shirt. So those three things are things to look out for. And what's interesting when you talk people through this, they go, oh. I'm being honest, I'm doing a bit of that, you know, or I'm doing a bit of this one. And we learn it very, you know, early on in life, don't we? You know, you're in trouble in school or with your brother and sister at home or whatever. It wasn't me, it was them kind of thing. Blame them or make excuses or the dog ate my homework when we're <laughs> at school or we're a victim. I've always been crap at maths anyway. So why would I even try? You know, we kind of fix those things. But the above the line, and that some sports teams call that the line of courage, You've got to go above the line and take responsibility. Now, in their model, they use accountability. I prefer responsibility because I think it's more a personal ownership yeah. thing. And it's basically about owning it. You know, whatever situation you're in, when I've had good times, bad times, it's a lot easier in good times to own stuff. And actually, what you were doing before is even though I was giving you compliments, you were pointing it out to everybody else. You weren't owning the good stuff, which mm. is a responsibility element. But going above the line, taking responsibility and moving away from blaming excuses and victim. And I think it's a really powerful thing to show people because there's no hiding from it for all of us. You know, and I, I, I've delivered sessions. It's absolutely true on that high performance element of a bum below the line. And I've walked into the kitchen, you know, if it was an online one, we've got a little, I want to say lodge at the bottom of the garden, but it, it's a shed. <laughs> and I'll walk in from the shed and I'll be whinging about something and Vicky, my wife, who's brilliant, will look at me and go, what session have you just done, <laughs> knowing full well? Uh, well, I've been doing, a, you know, the above below the line stuff and she just looks at me and goes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love her, yeah. yes, girl. Gets me. And I'm like, yeah, you're right, all right, okay, fine. I shall own take shit. responsibility. Yeah, own it. Just own your stuff. And, in fact, I was there was um, one um, production company were, were looking at doing a series on Own It and we were going to call it Own It, which, you know, working with people in a variety of life, you know, some young people, uh, just own your stuff, own where you are. Yeah. And I think that if, if, if we could get that mentality across in sport, it's brilliant, just own it, you know, own what's happened, own the win, own the loss, but own, and I think in life, it's a life lesson too. Well, I think going back to actually, like, listening to you explaining this to us, I was sat there thinking... Oh my god, that's literally like everything you say and you said, but like the pyramid when you're on about like how your your beliefs and stuff and how that affects your actions, but it's your experiences. And I was like, that's that is so. It just I was like, this makes so much sense because I was like, for me individually, like how I've grown up, my experiences are have made me why I am the way I am, why I'm passionate about certain things, why my morals are the way they are. Like that's kind of shaped that all down to the experience. And I was like. This man's talking complete sense. Yeah, I completely agree. But I was like, it is actually really powerful because that is actually what drives me and what is the result of my actions because of, yeah, the way my brain is now programmed because uh, of everything that I've been through. Yeah. So I sat there and I was like, as if I'd gone back and I was that like 12 year old little girl listening to be like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes so much sense. What I found really interesting was after hearing that, I started picking up on it everywhere. Yes. And to the point where it was like, what am I going to do about this? Because honestly, like, I would speak to people and I'd be like, that's below the line. line. Yeah. <laughs> but so I, my question for you is, what would be your advice in how to approach someone and explain to them that they are being below the line? Especially, it's, it's tricky because, like, I think the way you go about it is important because if you're like, that's below the line, then people are going to get their backs up and get defensive. But I think especially if we move this away from a sporting scenario, because generally speaking, being in a high sporting environment, I think people generally are better at taking ownership and that's quite generalised. But if I was to go to my family, to my friends outside of sport, like and try and approach to them, you're below the line, how would you try and deliver that in a way that's constructive? Well, first of all, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with you. Once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. Yeah. 
it's one of those things that you start seeing it everywhere. I think the the I think you've really answered the question that you've just given me previously. You've kind of got to see it and understand it. And once mm-hmm. I think you've seen the model and gone through it, then you gain an understanding. Because there's nothing worse, is there, that when you're in a difficult position, you know, when somebody says, well, you're just blaming, making excuses. Yeah. You're right, it could be seen as some kind of lecture or, you know, some really strong-worded, wrongly-timed advice. <laughs> but I think getting people to understand it and timing of that, would I would say, get the timing right, talk them through the model at a different time, but very often with teams I work with, whether it's in sport, business, police, NHS, education, wherever it is, um, very often they'll have it up in there and they'll use it as kind of a tracker to, you know, if somebody, if they are starting to do that, someone in the room is going to just look at it and just tap <laughs> on the picture of it and then very quickly it brings people back. You would have to really explain it. Now, I've had quite a few people who've seen it in a session in a work scenario and been like, listen, through any chance you can send me those slides because I need to do it with a family member and mm-hmm. I need to do it with them quickly. And my advice when somebody says, how do you get somebody else go, you've got to really talk them through the model and get them to see that you're not having a go. You're just giving them a frame, a set of glasses, if you like, yeah. to look at their issues of life. And if you put those glasses on, <coughs> you will see things differently than you currently do now. And, and it's one of those sessions. It changed me. You know, yeah. it changed the way I did things, particularly that that final element where you've got to see the issue because there's some people don't see there's an issue. So they're over there somewhere. Then you get people who can see it. Well, that's it. They just keep talking about that issue that they've got. Then there's people that see it and they own it, you know, kind of, if it's to be, it's up to me. I need to do something about that. But again, there's some people who just say, go and I need to do something, never get around to doing anything. Then you get the people who see it, own it and they solve it. So they go, right, here's the plan of what I can do in this scenario. And then there's a lot of people who have the plan, use resolutions, they see the issue, they own the issue, they've got a solution, they've got the plan, never get around to doing it. So really that whole model of see it, own it, solve it, do it. And I think when Connors and Smith put it together, it was just brilliant. And I I think it's, it's when it's applied and it's done through a conversation, because, you know, when I when I came in, you know, you work with lots of different teams and some teams are quite happy to just sit there and listen. You lot didn't. You were in the mixer. There was good banter in there. I mean, I had my leg pulled more than <laughs> a few times in there, but I loved it. You know, every time I come in to to work with you guys, you know, the staff, the, the, the players, they are brilliant to work with. Everybody's very welcoming and you get involved. Yeah. So when you've got some content like that and it's not become a talk, that wasn't a talk for me. That was a chat yeah. Yeah. with a couple of aid memoirs on on there, mm-hmm. be, being that model. And you lot actually carried it to a really cool place. And, mm. I, and I think there was there was real there was real power in that. So in answer to your question, I think it's it can be done. Timing of everything is just number one. And I think that you'd have to talk them through the process, maybe away from that issue, then take that model and reapply it to the issue. Because at the time, if I'd have heard it going through a time when I was doing, you know, the BMW stuff, the bitching, moaning, whinging stuff that we can all do in life, if I'd have done it at that point in my life, it probably wouldn't have worked. Seeing the model, understanding it, then reapplying, that's when the magic happened for me. Well, it really put, like, I I check myself now. Like, it's become, you talk about you give the brush and teeth as a habit. That's become a habit for me now. So, like... I always check it the most when I really don't want to do something or, like, when I'm in that really difficult headspace and that's when I challenge myself most on it, like, because I try and view it like I'd want to uphold that standard to somebody else if I was seeing someone else below the line. So it makes me be more comfortable on myself, Okay, even when no-one's watching. If I'm, I don't know, in the gym by myself, <clears throat> I can easily skip my rehab or skip a set, but then is that above or below the line do you know what I mean? it's really it's such a, something so simple and effective it's, it's so yeah. short and like it allows like you to just thing. like yeah, yeah. Like, what like, and, am I, it, come come away from yourself a minute and be like if i was watching me am i change, above or below the line changes your whole perspective yeah yeah um, it does one thing i wanted to chat to you about briefly was uh post-traumatic growth because that is definitely something you touched on in the chat and again something that really resonated with me 
Um, so I'm just going to let you open the floor with. Oh, I could go on for a long time about this. I'll, I'll, I'll do it in the briefest um, way possible. I'm fascinated, obsessed, probably is a better description, on positive psychology. Right. You know, I was. Uh, I love the story of Martin Seligman, who's known as the godfather of positive psychology. He comes in, uh, president of the American Psychological Association, and just nearly every single article written on the brain and psychology is about what's wrong with it. And he starts to go, well, we need to rip this script up and we need to start looking at what happens when the brain works well. And that's why we know more today. You know, if I'd have said six, seven years ago, you know, Alzheimer's, dementia, bipolar, schizophrenia, depression, you know, all of them, you've heard a lot about them. But what do you know about when the brain works well? Yeah. Well, most people go, oh, I've heard something about an endorphin, endorphin, <laughs> something like that. Um, uh, and we know now it's about, you know, endorphins. If you look at doses, the title people, a lot of people use. Um, TJ Power is on uh, Instagram. He's a fantastic lad and does brilliant neuroscience work. That idea of dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins, dose, you know, the understanding those and the things we can do about those. But one of the things that has been looked at over the years in this idea of let's look at the good stuff because PTSD, most people have heard of you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, something in the past that gets dragged through to now and gives people issues of varying levels and can be extremely debilitating and less debilitating, actually. We know a lot more about it now. But the same um, issue we know about is PTG, which is post-traumatic growth. That idea that not only can you go through a difficult time, you can grow through a difficult time and what's interesting about the ptg some people kind of see if it was on a graph that kind of you have this difficult you have the dip at the bottom but then you come back up to where you were no no this actually says you're better you go higher than your previous position so i think that 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 whole idea of understanding post-traumatic growth when people have difficult times is important and there's a hell of a lot of people that have ptg we just don't talk about it as we don't when we turn on the news, here's positive news stories. Yeah. And I think that the, the world of positive psychology, one great book on this, uh, The Happiness Advantage by Sean Acor, is well worth looking at because he's trying to shift our thinking in life, stop talking about trying to get success and hope that that leads to happiness, which is how we live life. You know, work hard, get the results, get the whatever, and then you can sip a daiquiri and... <laughs> by the pool in a week in Benidorm or wherever people <laughs> choose to go on holiday. Um, but actually what he's saying is the new way of looking at life is saying it's happiness we now know that leads to success. Yeah. You know, happy people and happy cultures, and this isn't superficial happiness because that links into toxic pos positivity, which is just bloody irritating. <laughs> you know, people who go, we're above ground and breathing. We're all right. That <laughs> happiness element is key. So I think the, 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 the whole conversation around creating happiness in organisations, the research is massive. You know, if you can create happy places, and again, that's scientific, not glib happiness or not superficial happiness, people will be more productive, resilient, creative and interdependent. Mm -hmm. So understanding that side of it is key and understanding where there is PTSD. Yes, there is. We should not shy away from that and brush that under the carpet. I'm not talking about a world where it's sunshine and rainbows. And butterflies. And butterflies <laughs> in there too. Um, uh, but we should be talking about a world in which, yes, there is PTSD, but there is PTG too. And yeah. we know now that there are ways in which we can work with people and help people which would be individualized depending on what people's issues are but there are ways in which people can grow through difficult times and that should be a message we should be talking about more yeah i just when i think about it like because i was thinking that i feel is very much my kind of journey of like yeah post-traumatic growth of like what I sh my life should have been like and what it is now is two complete polar opposites but yeah and I think for over the last year that's kind of I kind of gained confidence from the whole experience I've had to be like okay I've gone through really shit stuff yeah. and I've got to this point so going through three operations over the last year it's nothing that I can't get through because 
flipping that mindset of like, and we've spoken about it quite a lot over the last uh, few episodes of like, like control what you can control. Like it's a shit, it's a shitty sandwich. It's a shit sandwich. It is. But okay, what what are the positives? What positives can I take from this, or what can I gain, or how can I grow from this experience? And I think that's what's really helped me get through the last year. Otherwise, I don't know if I would have. But I think yeah, looking back on my life growing up like it's exactly what i think underpins that is that post-traumatic growth because like i said in reality i shouldn't really be where i'm at but it's because how much i then use my own mind to be like and no, I, I know where i need to be i don't want that to define me um i try to flip that into something positive rather than just accepting defeat or failure if that makes sense and i think what what you're saying there is that's a choice yeah it is a choice it's a choice, and and I mean, I would see you knowing your story and knowing the injuries actually you both had in recent times, particularly you, V, and your endo issues as well. You know, you would go into the bucket of resilience ninja uh, for <laughs> for all the right reasons. That's cool. That is um, cool. But you know, there's 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 learning within that. Yeah. You know, like 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 how the hell do you? do you do that? How the hell, Gwen, have you done the things you've done? You know, there's, it's for me, that's the fascination of this. Okay. So how have you done that? And what I think you're describing there is what I would say is like gratitude stuff, which is about rewiring, not just to focus on the difficult stuff, but to focus on the stuff that's going right as well. Cause when we get a cloud over us, bringing the book back in, <laughs> when we get a cloud coming over us, Insert clip. Book. please. Um, but when we get that cloud coming over us, you know, there's there's a different way of looking at it, yeah. and and that's where Martin Seligman, again, the Godfather of Positive Psychology, uses three those three Ps brilliantly. And I think when I hear somebody talking about what you've been through there, mm. I know it doesn't make sense because most people would absolutely be justified in feeling down and getting fed up and potentially throwing the towel in or walking off. But what what is it somebody's doing when they don't do that? And I think that is where the magic is. And it's about learning about that. And Martin Seligman's bits, you might want to put this in, you might want to edit it out. Um, but his bits, because I've used quite a bit of science, by the way, that's why I'm no, it's good. It's all right. careful. It's good. Um, three elements he talks about. Number one is we personalise it. We think it's just us. It's only me it's ever happened to. Like yeah. We just internalise it all. Second thing is we think what's called pervasively. I'm not too sticking two fingers at you, by the way. I'm just, I'm just realising I'm just flicking the Vs at you. Right, get on to number two and three. So number we can two. Stop. Sorry. No, number two is being number two is being pervasive. Yeah. Which is so what? that means it affects everything. Mm. So everything's wrong in my life. Every bit of my life is a car. Well, it's not. I've got an injury. So it's being able to say it's not pervasive. And then the third element is we think in terms of permanence. This is going to last forever. Mm. And, of course, what I think, having talked to you before, what you did was, it's not just me. There's been quite a few people get injuries. It's not everything in my life that's going wrong, and this won't last forever. This too shall pass. Those three Ps, knowing you both and having chatted with you both, I can see those three in you. And when people get into a dip, they can get stuck if they personalise, pervasive, think it's everything and think it's going to last forever. Well, we I do feel like we have really tried, me especially, tried to rewire how we think. Um, like, I know you, you, Gwen, takes the mick out of me about my, like, you know, my quote of, like, <laughs> can delve and self-pity or whatever. But, like, <clears throat> I really had to try and rewire how I thought because, like, if I use my injury, yeah, I thought, oh my gosh, if I have that injury, oh, life's over. And then it was just back to back of bullshit all the time. And, like... Yeah, I think a like year ago, me wouldn't have been able to cope with that, but I really worked hard trying to rewire how I thought. Because um, I was like, well, like, <laughs> it's just me in this scenario. Like, life's still going on around this. So if I'm not taking care of how I think and how I'm I'm fronting up to this experience, should I, should I say, um, then what's the outcome going to be? For me, all of Shit that was... <laughs> for me, all of that was huge. Like... As soon as I had my injury and then I had my, like, had my op and stuff like that, the happiness thing was huge for me because I just all of a sudden was like, because I had a period of time, like, maybe one to two weeks after my op where I was 
what I would describe as in a hole for myself. Like I was just like, yeah, I felt like it was never going to end. And I was just really in a hole. I'd lost my sense of purpose. I couldn't get out of bed without being in pain. It was just not, not fun at all. Um, and it was just like a hard stop in my life where I was like, I've lost who I am. I don't know what's going on. And I was in conflict in my own brain. Like I should be being productive in this time. But my other part was like rest. It was horrible. And then the way I got out of that was like, right, okay. So I, I literally just went outside and sat in the sun and had my coffee outside. And I was like, I think I'm quite happy. <laughs> and I just sat there with it for a bit. And then I did that the next day and the next day and the next day. And all of a sudden I started to like open up and look at, you know, this isn't affecting the rest of my life. Actually, it's opening opportunities for me to do things that I might not have been able to do had I been a fully fit rugby player. And I was like, okay, well, it's actually not so bad then, is it? So I started branching out into other areas of my life and I ended up getting a role as an ACL uh, rehab and strength and conditioning coach. And I was like, well, that, well, that wouldn't have happened if I'd not done my ACL. And all of a sudden, all these other doors, it has a knock-on effect, but it all came back to finding happiness from something else. So, like, as an athlete, it's quite easy to just channel all your purpose into, I'm an athlete, and that's it. But for me, I know now I'm so much more than just an athlete. That's just, that's my job. But I have things outside of that as well, and that's such a big part for my happiness but in yeah. general life, I think if you get if you're in that dark, closed off tunnel vision mindset, then you're not going to find opportunities. They're not going to find you because you're shut off to everything else. Your curtains are closed, not they're padlocked. Not nothing's coming through nah. the nothing's coming through the door. Like I think you have to be able to op be open. Like yes, there's some shit that goes on, but like as soon as you just just completely just flip it and be like, all right tomorrow's a new day and just just like you're saying like if you you're, if you'd stayed in that hall oh it could have been a then you would have those up yeah story. that would have been close as soon as you open yourself up then whoa, poof butterflies yeah you know like it's it's i mean it's i probably didn't say it probably as scientifically as you'd want me to but you know <laughs> what i'm trying to say I'm, i know what you're saying um and that's that's not a shit sandwich have we moved away from the shit sandwiches because there's been a few such we shit have sandwiches. just used it as a great example yeah it, but that is <laughs> That is really powerful, um, how you've both framed it yeah. in your own heads. You know, you're you're thinking about your thinking of something else, which is called metacognition. You're yeah. thinking about thinking. It's a good word, that is. I've used that before. No, it is. <laughs> and it's a, it's a really important one. Gwen, you, you, you told me about that. And mm -hmm. I was like, that is, that's significant. And, and I think what that will will have done in that kind of pervasiveness element of, of those three Ps is I think there's a there's a real danger in anybody in any field, right? So when I work with CEOs of enormous companies, right, or um, head coaches or elite athletes, one of the dangers, the big worrying signs I think people can fall into is, hi, my name's Gwen, I'm a rugby player. Yeah. Gwen, the rugby player. Fee, the rugby player. Drew, the leadership geek, or whatever <laughs> you want to call me. Actually, I'm Drew. Yeah. Mm. Who happens to do leadership at the moment? Um, yeah. And I've done lots of other things. <laughs> yeah. And 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 for your the your your fee and your your Gwen. And I think if we tie ourselves to our job title, that can be quite a dangerous thing. We're so much more. As you were saying that, then mm. I was like going, oh my goodness, like that is going to be so powerful for listeners because if you just see yourself as your job. That is dangerous because yeah. you are basing your whole self-image on something that not, not only have you not got the, the whole control over, it's not even accurate. That isn't you. That's where you are in this moment in time. You are so much more than that. Mm. And there are so many other things. And, and it's very interesting, I think, how you two have dealt with your injuries to come through it. Because some people might go, you're a sports person, you're injured, you have slightly easier days, what's wrong with you? Well, you're you... joking. I'm there for bloody hours. <laughs> yeah, but that's what know. some people perceive. They do perceive. Some like people do. Oh, and you know, some I've people had... think you've got days off. You yeah, have extra days off. I've had people being like, so what are you doing now then? And, then? and I'm like, you know, you can't you can't fault people for thinking that way either. Yeah. Because if you're not in an environment that's an elite sports environment. You don't know. You know, if you're injured, to what? to the external world, you can't do your job. Yeah. So what, you want sick pay or but something? No, yeah. it doesn't work like that. I also it? think that your job can be taken away from you just like that. You get yeah. sacked, fired, dropped, whatever. Like just, and I think 
uh, that is the harsh. I think that's the reality that we face. Where like it can be taken away in a blink of an eye. So it's like maximizing your time because you don't know how long you've got in it. And also the flip side of it being it's not the be all and end all. And I think like something that we've appreciated is doing something like this podcast because it's something else. Also, injury we has. Sorry, were you finished? No, no, then? you can go. Yeah, okay. you can go. Injury. I just want to check. <laughs> I was just thinking if this kicks PJ. off in here. <laughs> I'm not refereeing. I'm leaving. Yeah. I'm right. leaving. <laughs> Injury for me has allowed me to realise that it's about my values and what I want from whatever I do in any given moment. So for me, it's things like always learning and being curious. It's things like inspiring the next generation through my actions and sharing my experiences. So like I say right now, that how do I do that as a rugby player? Well, for me, it's I share a lot about, like I try to share my stories on social media. I try and show young girls that they can be, uh, they can be a rugby player and that it doesn't matter how, what they're like. Or a coach or a podcast. Yeah, or they can, they can <laughs> do whatever they want to do. And also they shouldn't try and be someone else doing that either. However, in 10 years time, when I'm maybe not a rugby player anymore, then that might manifest differently. But I think it made me like really think about it's it's about your values as a as a person and and your morals and how do you take them into whatever job you're doing because i believe that if i was to lose my job as a rugby player and go into any given job i could take those values and morals and mm. apply them to that scenario so it detaches you like you're saying from what you know it it's not out in your control so it detaches that can i can i simplify it even more yeah in in my head and and this is not a, a point to make this is more of a question is it not just about you understanding who you are? Yeah. Yes, is it is. You but know, there's a there's a, there's a there's a there's a great quote. I think it's Mark Twain. Um, so if it's not, edit this out. <laughs> <laughs> I think he said there's two important days in your life. When you're born and you're dead. When you're born. No, when you're born and you discover who you are. Oh, when sorry. you're born, and then you dis- the second day is when you discover why. Oh, yes, wow, that's powerful, that is a isn't clip it? that now, is strong. Now that. <laughs> That I, I I'm just listening to you. I, I know you both well. Um, I've uh, all the time in the world for both of you, but it's only during this podcast I've kind of worked out that the difficult times have grown you. I believe mm. because I think you both know who you are more as a result of it. And life is a journey when we're working ourselves out all the time. But it's not about you two being rugby players or Drew being a leadership geek or you two being podcasters as well. It's more than that. I think when you know who you are. That then, that is the bit that I've always used to decide whatever job I'm going to do or not do or say yes to or no to. It's that guiding principle that is, this is this is who I am. This is what I do, and therefore that's a that that is a very powerful thing for people. We've actually mentioned it. I think Matt said on the reflection, but we, I said I feel like this last year has kind of made me really re-sculpt or really kind of think about who am I as a person who do I want to be and like I feel like I've just scraped everything back and just like thought about all right like yeah who am I what where do I want to be where am I going and like what do I want to be remembered for and also what do I want to be proud of and like that's now where I feel like I'm in a place where like I'm really happy with those answers um because yeah, for these last few months, even, like, saying my story, no way would... I, like, I knew that day would come. I never knew when it was going to come. But, like, the the fact that I got to the stage where I had... Like, I felt brave enough to do it. I was like, wow. I've, like... It was just, like, a switch in me where I was like, I've I've grown. Yeah. I'm a big-ass bitch. <laughs> this, well, actually, the conversation topic leads very nicely into I the I thought you were going to go into the question yeah, about that. Okay, so I'm going to phrase it a bit different, but... Okay. Um... Fast forward. Yeah. It was, right, your wait. funeral, unfortunately. No, wait, wait, say this is the question. This is the question, by the way. Okay. We have a closing tradition on this podcast, as I know you're aware. And <laughs> I, I am. we're going to ask you a question. Okay. Okay, so fast and it's forward. A, it's to do with my funeral. It is. <laughs> Brilliant. Right, your funeral. Thanks. Someone comes up and does a eulogy on you. What three words would you like to be described as? Yeah, full stop. Wow. He's still thinking about the fact he's at his funeral. Yes, I am. I'm it. thinking, I hope someone turns up. We'll oh, be we'll there. Be there. We'll be there. Oh, thanks, thanks, ladies. <laughs> Appreciate it. 
Um, okay, what three words would I want at my funeral? I don't mind singing when you're thinking if you want. If she likes to do this. My hymn, <laughs> what word? That's the national anthem. I, I love your national anthem. But you obviously didn't know. You don't, because you don't know yeah, what I was singing. He just doesn't like I you just, singing it. It was just your singing, <laughs> to be honest, babe. Um, well, that is, you know, Very... I love the Welsh... Seriously, I'm, I'm, I'm delaying the time <laughs> yeah, here, like, But I love the Welsh national anthem. Thank you. I actually feel I'm Welsh. Good, you Great. should. I've got a caravan love, in North love, Wales. Yeah, so you, are, you told me this. I, I know. First I've got time a caravan. I met me, I'm basically Welsh. I've got a caravan in North I Wales. Have, yeah, yeah, I have in North Wales. So that makes me Welsh, doesn't it? Uh, we we'll take anyone see. that that wants to be Welsh. I don't want to take anyone. No, but I I think that if someone isn't Welsh and they say I am Welsh, uh, I love that. All right. Because I'm like you're chew, you want to be Welsh. I love that. But I want the national anthem played at my funeral. Thank you. Okay, right. So we're much. digressing here. Come on. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I would I would want the three words. I think um, I think I'd want people to say I cared. That's that's one of the biggest things. I only do things if I really care. In fact, that's the problem I've got because if I don't <laughs> care about it, you've got a real problem with oh, me shit. doing anything about it. I think um, I'd want to be known as a, a family guy. Um, you know, my family are everything. My, my wife's incredible. My three boys, Tom, Finn and Max, are just uh, another level. I couldn't be prouder of them. Um, they're, they're special people. So I think I cared, family... And uh, it'd have to be two words. I think. Uh, Can we put a hyphen in the middle? Is time? that all right? Yeah. Like, it might be three, actually. Oh, I'm dyslexic. Oh. Right, so I'm going to get away with it, I think. <laughs> Sorry, dyslexia police or where, whatever. Um, I, th I, think, I think just made a difference. Nice. Impactful. Yeah. Imp thanks. You're welcome. I do. I think, I think I'd, I'd, I'd just want to, you know. When you said that earlier about that talk, because we didn't, I didn't know what we were going to talk about today. That actually took me aback. Really did. That kind of made me go, "Wow," and that made me think, "Gosh, that's that's really cool that 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 you've you've had that impact on the world." Steve Jobs said, "Leave your dent in the universe." I don't know whether I'll make a dent, um, but I, I want to have done some good for people, not just my family who who I adore, but I want to have done some good while I'm here and that I cared about stuff I think that's what I'd say yeah, Im nice. Im impactful cared family yeah nice well that. as I did say if I didn't have didn't meet you and listen to talk that day definitely wouldn't have been at a point now that I would have said told you know said my story or be sat here you know co-hosting a podcast so and that's impact that is impact so you're a pretty epic dude <laughs> Dude, you also say it how it is, so I like that about <laughs> you as well. Um, and yeah, legend, thank thanks you so much for coming lot, on the podcast. Yeah, I have a lot of respect for you, yeah. a lot of respect for what you do. Be we both are big believers in what you say, yeah. you don't just chat shit, like, you, you there is substance <laughs> to it, you know. <laughs> don't just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, some of it, but some, some no, of it is. uh, yeah, yeah, and I think your personality comes through in the work that you do, so keep it up. Thank you, you. are making a keep difference. Keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> really good work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to be nice. <laughs> right, well, you, you were. regret it. You're, you're, you no, 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 it was no, just I, funny. I, the way I, you said I appreciate it. it. Right. And I, I do. Uh, seriously, look, I'm taking the compliment. You weren't. <laughs> Thank you. I am. Thank you. And um, it's, been a, it's been a privilege to come on it and keep saying it how it is. Because like I said before, when it comes to impact, this will impact. And you might never know the impact, but it will be. Somewhere, somewhere. It's like the stone in the in the water. The ripple could go anywhere. And that literally could save somebody's life. Wow. Don't Thank you very again. much. Thank you very much. Um, you didn't do the smile. There you go. <laughs> there it is. I, I've achieved. Um, My work here is done. If you'd like to like, follow and subscribe, that would be really nice. Thank you. Smile. <laughs> Like, follow, and subscribe. I started the podcast, so I'd like to finish it, please. Okay, okay please. no worries. Please like, follow, and subscribe. These two ladies are doing a fantastic job. They are the real deal. Please unbuckle your seats from the roller coaster ride that has been episode two yeah. of series two of Say It How It Is podcast. See you later, folks, and good night. No, mate. And remember, Say It How It Is. To keep to saying, keep saying it how, how it is. is. And remember... No. <laughs> Keep saying it how it is. It'll do. It'll do. Keep saying it how it is. Keep saying it how it is.
Yep, thank Keep you. Peace, peace and love. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.